acknowledge that we were founded on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabewaki, the Attawandaronk, the Mississauga and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and now live on land that is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We have many representatives working across this land now known as Ontario, and we acknowledge that there are 46 treaties and other agreements that cover the territory. We are grateful to be able to work and live on this land, and thankful to the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial, and who continue to contribute to the strength of Ontario and to all communities across the province. To continue to center reconciliation, we encourage our team, partners, students, and teachers to take time to learn about the lands they are currently on. Visit native-land.ca for more information. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our virtual field trip for today and happy local food week. To celebrate, we are going to be taking a tour of Graham's apiary. An apiary is the term for a location where beehives and honeybees are kept. So we're going to be able to learn all about how to be a beekeeper, the hives, all the different types of bees, and the honey that they create. So my name is Madison. I am the events assistant at Eggscape. And here with me today is Graham, who is the beekeeper at Lost Meadows Apiary. So. If anybody has questions throughout the field trip, just send them in the comments. Graham would love to hear from you. And Graham, do you want to introduce yourself before we get into our videos? Sure. So thanks, Madison. And like Madison said, uh, so my name's Graham and uh, I'm a beekeeper. I've been keeping bees for around 12 years now um, and I do beekeeping for honey. Um, I'm the president of the Ontario Bee Breeders Association, so I run a province-wide queen bee breeding program, which isn't covered in these videos because it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but we do that, and I participate in lots of research, and I have a little over 200 beehives, and I breed queen bees. So we're going to have a fun time uh, having a look in all the hives today. I hope I covered everything, and feel free to tell me any questions you guys have. I'll, I'll try to answer as best I can. Awesome. Thanks so much. So what we're going to be doing is showing you little videos that Graham just took the other day of his hives. And then Graham's going to answer some of your questions after each little video. So the first one we're going to be doing is about himself as a beekeeper, what that means exactly, and the equipment that he uses. Hey, everyone. My name's Graham and I'm the beekeeper here at Lost Meadows Apiaries and Meadery. I have a little over 200 beehives, and I'm gonna be showing everyone today what is inside a beehive. We're gonna talk about honey, how do beekeepers get honey, um, some basic tools that you need to be a beekeeper, and then we're gonna go in and show you inside the hive and what's going on. So first, I'm gonna cover a few things about what exactly is a beekeeper and what tools do you need to do beekeeping. So first, a beekeeper is just simply someone that takes care of beehives. And you can take care of hives for a number of reasons. For me, mainly, it's for honey. So my bees make honey uh, that I put into jars and sell. I also make queen bees, so I breed bees and sell queens to other beekeepers like hobby beekeepers or other commercial beekeepers as well. Um, and some uh, beekeepers also keep bees to pollinate fruits and vegetables. So things like blueberries or apples or cranberries are, uh, are all pollinated by honeybees when they uh, get sent into the orchards. So those are some reasons uh, why you would be a beekeeper. And being a beekeeper is really trying to balance what's good for the bees and what's good for the beekeeper. So we wanna make sure the bees are happy uh, we want to make sure they want to stay in the beehives and so it's a really balancing act between making sure the bees are happy and then also being able to do some work as a beekeeper. So to be a beekeeper you need a couple things. One, you need a smoker. So here's a smoker and what the smoke does is it masks pheromone smells. So honeybees communicate by smell. So um, sometimes the bees at the front of the hive will say, oh, there's an intruder, watch out. And the smoke 
mask that smell so that uh, other honeybees don't realize that there's some alarm bells going off. Um, I have a hive tool. So this is so that when I'm working in the hive, you'll see me use it all the time, moving frames around, prying them up. I have a little queen roller here. So this is so that when I'm working in the hive, if I find the queen, I'll tuck her in here just for a few minutes so I don't hurt her when I'm going through the hive. And on here, I also have a queen bee marking pen. So this is red. The, all queens born this year will be marked red, and I'll cover that later. And the last thing you need is your veil. So this is just so that when I'm working the bees, sometimes I might make a mistake or sometimes the bees aren't very happy. So this just makes sure I don't get stung in my face, uh, which is never a great thing. And with that, let's go check out the bees. Awesome. So I hope you all learned a little bit about the equipment and what it means to be a beekeeper. Um, why don't we answer a question before we go into the next video? Did you want me to read them out? Sure. Okay. Uh, so my kindergartner would like to know how bees make their hives, especially the little cells for the babies. Great question. So the actual hive body is wood and the bees don't make that. What we're trying to do is mimic a cavity like they would be in a tree. Uh, so that's made by uh, the beekeeper and then the actual comb inside. So everything in the hive, all of the wax is called comb. And what it's used for is in front of the, the name. So honey comb is where honey stored and brood comb is where the baby uh, bees are born or pollen or that's in the brood nest um, and honeybees what they do is they eat honey and they actually 3d print on their body they have uh, wax glands on their uh, stomachs and they print out little sheets of wax and then they take them and they stick them and that's how they build it so it takes around 10 pounds of honey to make one pound of beeswax so building uh, beeswax is very uh, resource costly uh, in the beehive. And so that's sort of how they do it. In terms of the actual shape and stuff, they do things called festooning, where they'll all hold hands together and map out where they're going to put the honeycomb uh, and things like that. That's so cool that they hold hands <laughs> in order to create their hive. Yeah. That is awesome. Okay, why don't we get into the next uh, video and then we can answer a couple more questions after that one. So in this one, we're gonna learn more about the hive. Okay, so now we're gonna start to go into the hive. First, we're gonna cover the few basic parts of the beehive. So this is called the outer cover, it has a nice uh, little steel top on it. So this protects everything from rain, wind, anything like that. These boxes here are called honey supers. So this is actually where honey is stored that beekeepers can uh, remove from the bees. So uh, this is the honey that uh, I'll be removing. We'll show you that. Then uh, between here is a queen excluder. You'll be able to see it more once we get into the hive. And down here is called the brood chamber. The brood chamber is where the queen bee is. That's where all the baby bees are. And that's where the real heart of the bee colony is. So let's crack it open. So first, we're gonna take the lid off, and we're gonna put it here because we're gonna stack our honey supers. Then what you wanna do is have your smoker going. You want nice, cool smoke. You might see some grass coming out of here. So we have a fire in the bottom, but I want the smoke to go through grass so it's nice and cool because we don't wanna blow hot smoke at the bees. So I'm gonna give them a little bit of smoke there, and then I'm gonna give them a little bit of smoke at the entrance just to make sure everyone's happy. And then we're gonna take off the inner cover. So this is called the inner cover, so it separates the honey supers or the brood chamber from the outer cover. Okay, so this is a honey super. Um, I'll go over what's in here a little later. So I'm gonna take all these off so that we can get down to the brood chamber and find the queen. And they get a little heavy. They can be up to 50 pounds, these ones.
Okay, so we made it down to the brood chamber. So I'm just gonna do a little puff of smoke across the top. This is the hunt. This is called the queen excluder. And this may just look like a regular piece of steel grate, but what it's actually for is to keep the queen bee down here. Um, and so these uh, bars are at a very specific width. So worker bees can pass through them, but the queen bee can't. So that means that she doesn't come up and lay any eggs in the honey super. So all of the baby bees are kept down here, just honey's kept up in the honey supers, and that makes extracting much easier. Uh, it's much easier on the beehive too when we're taking the honey away. And so uh, I really like to use queen excluders. So we're just gonna place that. Ah, we'll place it over here. Okay, so now we're into the brood chamber. This particular one has nine frames. So these bars here, you'll see in a second, are go the whole depth and these are called frames. So this is where all the honeycomb is that the bees live and work on. So what we're gonna do is start to pull some out and we're gonna try to find the queen. So let's do that. Awesome. There's so many bees in just one hive. That's crazy. All right. Let's see how many or how many bees, first of all, do you think live in a hive? And then let's get a question from the audience. Okay. So, uh, yeah, on a, the hive, um, uh, population fluctuates based on the season. So, uh, peak, uh, egg laying season or population is right around the summer solstice honeybees revolve around the sun um, and so towards the end of june uh, there'll be between 50 and 60 thousand bees in a single brood chamber hive like that one and uh, that population though in february or march at the very end of winter might be as low as 10,000. Uh, so the queen bee her job is to constantly keep the population being built because there's always bees dying every day, whether it's dragonflies or birds or anything like that. Uh, so she's, uh, she's in charge of constantly laying eggs and trying to build the population up. Wow. All right. Now let's grab a question from the audience. Uh, okay. What type of species of bee has the largest queen bee? Um, you know what? I actually don't 100% know that answer. There's over 20,000 different species of bees. Uh, so more than mammals, uh, less than beetles, but uh, they're like the second most populated uh, species. Um, in uh, Here in North America, our native bees are bumblebees. Uh, and I would have to uh, assume that would be the biggest queen bee. Bumblebees have queens. Um, but the majority, the vast majority of bees are solitary bees. So there's not really a queen bee, worker bee, um, thing like that with honeybees or bumblebees. There's just only one bee. And so the biggest queen bee, I would imagine, would be a, a bumblebee. And there's about 100, I think there's 190 different subspecies of bumblebees. So you'd have to check to see which bumblebee is the biggest and then figure out what, uh, yeah. from which one would be the biggest. Yeah. Wow, I did not know there is that many species of bees. That is so cool. All right, so speaking of queens, why don't we go into our next video where we're gonna actually try to find the queen and we'll be able to see how big it is in Graham's hive. So when you're working in the beehive, you wanna be really gentle. You don't wanna squish any bees or anything like that and you just really slow movements. And I actually found the queen on the first frame. So here she is. I'll show you her in just a second. Okay, so here we are. And this is the queen. Now you can see there's just a little bit of yellow left on her. Um, so that means that she was born last year. Um, now it's going to be a little bit hard to see because she's, she knows something's going on. So she's not going to be laying any eggs, but the queen walks all along on the frames here and she lays eggs. So her job is to lay up to 2000 eggs a day in the peak egg, 
egg laying time, which is right around now. The honeybees really um, revolve around the sun and so the solstice is coming up at the uh, end of June here and so she will be in peak egg laying then. So she walks around, here she is, she puts her head in cells and she looks for one to lay in um, and she always has some of these attendants. You see some of these worker bees looking, uh, looking after her. They're there to always feed her, take care of her, make sure she's happy and so she has this sort of royal escort all the time uh, when, she's, uh, when she's walking around. So I'm going to pick her up and I'm going to put her in my little queen holder here and then I'm going to go through the rest of the hive. So here we go. So a queen bee, you can pick her up by her thorax. So I'll just show you a little bit closer here. So this is the queen's head here. So you can see the, li the little yellow mark there is on her thorax where her wings attach. And then this is her abdomen here. So queen bees, they have a stinger, but they don't sting beekeepers. They won't sting anyone other than other queen bees. So queen bees are the only uh, one in the hive. They don't have a barbed stinger. So that means that they can sting multiple times. And what happens in when queen bees first hatch at the very beginning of their life, there might be other queen bees that hatch. And so she uh, uses that stinger and they fight to the death and they have a big, big fight. And then the last one standing becomes the queen of the hive. And then she goes on to mate and become the mother of the entire hive. So all of these bees in here came from this queen. She's the mother of everyone. So I'm just going to set her in the hive here and I'm all right awesome we were able to find the queen all right any questions about this do yes honeybee do honeybees sting yes they do yep um they don't sting the same as uh wasps or yellow jackets because uh they have a barbed stinger uh so they only can sting once and they die after they sting but uh they do my, my bees are pretty gentle, so I haven't been stung yet in any of those videos. They're not trying to sting me, but uh, yes, honeybees do. Well, that's crazy. All right, have one more question before we go into our next video. Uh, why do you use a marker to mark the queen bee? So um, you don't have to do that, but if you're doing any type of research, so uh, you need to know that you have the same queen and you want to track when she was born. Uh, and queen bees can kind of all look similar. Um, so you want to make sure she has a mark on her. It doesn't affect her in any way. Um, and what that is for is, so that hive is actually one of my breeder hives. So I really like the characteristics of it. And so if I want to make more queens from it, I need to know that I'm making queens from that queen. Uh, if that hive requeens itself or different queens in there, then all of the data that I have from years past on that hive is no longer valid because there's a different genetic uh, makeup of that colony. And so um, we mark queens to know how old they are. And for breeding or research purposes, we need to know that it's the same queen and not a new one. So that queen was born last year. So I have research data on her from last year. I'll have data on her from this year as well. And I'll still use her next year. And so I want to see if she can live for three years. Um, and then I'll see how she's doing. And I may requeen her at the end of next year. Uh, so uh, hopefully by then I've had lots of daughters from her and I can assess her daughters. And so I actually have breeding lines. So I have different breeding lines of different genetic lines that I graph from and cross. And you want to keep the genetics diverse in honeybees. Awesome. Lots of science involved. That's yeah. great. Yeah. All right. So I know we're talking about bee stings. And Graham actually was able to get a video for us of him getting stung. And so we got a close up video of that so you can see exactly what's happening when you get stung and what you should do if you also get stung. So here's the video. Thanks, Graham, for, uh, for getting that footage. No problem.
And the last thing I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna show you guys a bee sting. Uh, so I'm gonna grab a, a worker bee here. So there's the stinger. So honeybee stingers are barbed, remember? Oh, you can actually even see venom coming out. So we'll see if she'll sting me. She's gonna sting me. There we go. So now if you see the singer, it's still pumping. So what's interesting about a honeybee stinger is this stinger actually has its own separate nervous system and it'll keep pumping venom into me for up to 30 minutes. So even though the, the bee's gone, it'll keep pumping, see it moving? And it keeps pumping, pumping, it has its own nervous system and it'll stay and do that for up to 30 minutes. So that's something uh, interesting about honeybees and that's why you should always try to take it out so if you get stung by a honeybee, just scrape the stinger off. Oh, this one, there we go. And you wanna get that off as fast as you can so that it doesn't keep pumping the venom into you. So that's it for the bee tour. All right, so there you have it. There was Graham getting stung by a bee and it was super cool to see the stinger still pumping the venom into you. So what were you, you were saying something to me before about trying to get that footage. Was it easy to get a bee to sting you? No, that was actually the third attempt. I, I couldn't get them to sting me. Uh, so uh, we had tried a couple times and Sarah, my friend who was doing the videography, she was like, well, I'll try a third time. We'll try it. And then uh, finally we did. So uh, I guess I have nice bees. They didn't even want to sting me when I was trying. So. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, now let's grab a few questions. Okay, that's a good one. How do bees find their way back to the hive? I might cover this a, a bit in a, in, a, in a video coming up, but uh, honeybees uh, see in a different light spectrum than we do. So they see in the ultraviolet spectrum. So to them, red is black, um, but they can see more uh, uh, hues in the ultraviolet and they also can see polarized light which is something we cannot see um, and so they use their ability to see polarized light uh, like an onboard gps so polarized light super simply is like they can see literal rays of, of sunshine and so they can track where it is and honeybees also use um, the color of their hives so you'll see all my hives are painted different colors that is intentional so that they can make their way back when they come to a crowded area of lots of hives and they use landmarks and things like that. So if there's a big tree or something like that, they'll, they'll know where to go. When a honeybee is, is uh, shifting from being a, a hive nurse nest bee to a forager bee um, around day 20 of its life, it actually, they do what's called orientation flights. Um, and we didn't capture that on any of the video, but that's actually, uh, the, the, the worker bee will leave the entrance and fly about three or four feet and then come back and memorize how to go back. And you can see it. It looks like a, it looks like a, a washing machine spinning sort of at the front of the hive. And it's just these bees just memorizing, going and coming and going and coming. And so that's called orientation flight. So then you'll see them start to go further and further and they might go 15 or 20 feet from the hive and come back in. And that's that's all the, the young bees training from uh nurse bees to forager bees they're they're training their flight training and learning how to get back and so they they do a work they memorize it they literally memorize where they're going and then they use the polarized light when they're farther away to to know how to get back to the hive wow that's awesome how about we do one more question <clears throat> do bees talk well that's a great question <laughs> so bees uh Bees communicate. I, talking, I don't think would be the right term to use, but they communicate for sure. And they communicate through a number of ways. They have a very complex uh, communication uh, system. So they communicate through touch. They communicate through pheromone, which is uh, smells, whether it's they pass uh, kind of pass smells along or, uh, or um, make them themselves. Um, and then they uh, communicate visually 
uh, through dancing. So honeybees do something called the waggle dance, um, which uh, uh, was discovered uh, some time ago. And it's how honeybees communicate to each other where nectar is or if they're swarming where they want to go and live. And so a waggle dance is a combination of uh, the honeybee will walk on the comb and shake its bum and then do a circle and then walk on the comb, shake its bum and then do a circle like this. And the axis of where it's shaking its bum is the direction where you should leave from the entrance of the hive. So they actually uh, take that uh, horizontal direction, put it vertically on the comb and shift it. And the amount, uh, how quickly it wiggles its bum is how much energy or the distance you need to fly. So it'll literally be shaking its bum and telling you the direction. And so it might be like, okay, like fly really fast uh, in this direction. And there's amazing flowers over there. And that's how they communicate a waggle dance. So sometimes if I see if there's a bloom shift on and I'm in my hive and I'll see a bee with pollen on its legs, shaking its bum like crazy, I know something they really likes coming to bloom and trying to tell everyone to go over there the next time to get some honey. <laughs> that's awesome. So next time students, you want to tell your parents or your teacher something or want to show them where it is, do a little dance and then point in the right direction and you'll be doing the bee dance. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So why don't we go into the next video? And this is going to be about hatching a bee, right? We're going to see. It's uh, it's a, the worker bee. Uh, at, yeah, it's at the end of its life in the honeycomb. So it's gone through egg, larvae, pupae, and now it's uh, coming out into its adult bee life is what we call it. Awesome. And we're going to see, I think, maybe its job once it does arrive. So uh, let's see that video. Okay, so this is a hatching bee right here. So this is a worker bee, so a female bee that's going to try to come out. So um, like I said, on day eight, the cappings go on. And then afterwards, what the worker bee does is once it's developed into an adult bee, she chews her way out. So she's been chewing at this capping and we'll, uh, we'll wait and see if she can come out. So you can see her antennae come out. And she keeps trying to come out, but come out, but her thorax is getting stuck. So she's going to try to keep chewing it a little longer. And uh, we'll see if she can pull herself out. So she's trying, her head's out. She keeps trying to push, but she just can't quite get through. Maybe what I'll do is I'll help her out a little bit here. Okay, there we go. Let's see if she can come out now. There she is. Almost there. Her butt stuck. There we go. So she's going to come out and right away start to do tasks in the hive. So here she is here. You can see she's just a little bit lighter in color than the other bees. So her, uh, she, she'll sort of, um, darken over the next uh, few minutes. She's going to probably grab a little drink of nectar here and right away her first job is she's going to become a cell cleaner. So see this bee right here. This is the cell she just hatched out of. Can you see this bee just went in there? So right away that bee dives in and she's going to start to clean that cell so that our queen can come back and lay an egg in it. So that's how quickly the bees come out. They they uh, work right away. They have to clear as much space as possible so that the queen can uh, continue to lay. So this bee is going to start cleaning. And here's our bee over here that just hatched. And she's going to get to oriented really soon and start to uh, get uh, assigned some of her jobs. So worker bees um, are really what make the hive go uh, you know, around every single day every minute of every day they're working tirelessly at all kinds of things so for the first few days our uh, young bee here and there you go she's already starting her job so this is her here and she's already starting to clean this cell so she's going to do that for a few days 
And then after she hits about five days old, she can start to feed the young baby larvae. So she can start to make royal jelly. So she's going to start to feed uh, the larvae royal jelly, or we call it worker jelly if it's worker bees. And then as she gets a little bit older, she's going to turn into um, what these bees are doing. So can you see these two bees here? So those two bees were just exchanging nectar. So the forager bees go out and they bring nectar back and then they pass it off to their sisters in the hive. So they will pass off nectar to each other. And so there's the nectar receiving bees in the hive and then there's the nectar collecting foragers outside of the hive. And once the, they're that age, they're doing uh, some of the more comb building and they're packing honey in the hive. And then once they hit about 20 days old, they're going to be out and they're going to be foragers for the rest of their life. So um, when a bee's a forager, they're foraging for two or actually three things. They're foraging for nectar, which is the sweet stuff that honey's made out of. They're foraging for pollen, which is uh, what we saw earlier. They turn it into bee bread. And then they're also foraging for propolis. All right. Graham, do you want to finish that sentence? What are they foraging for? For propolis, which is uh, <clears throat> a long time ago when beekeepers and botanists weren't totally talking. So propolis is called resin, and that was in the botany world for a long time. Um, and then beekeepers called this stuff in the hive propolis. And then it wasn't until some time where they realized they're talking about the same thing. Uh, <laughs> so propolis is uh, something that trees do on their tree buds um, and things like that. And it's an antibacterial sort of immune defense system for trees that honeybees actually take advantage of and collect. And there's lots of uh, new research going on, uh, tons of tons of research uh, from the Minnesota uh, Bee Lab by Dr. Marla Spivak on propolis and the amazing benefits it has. Um, and uh, it's part of the uh, beehive's immune system. So each honeybee has an immune system, but the entire colony itself, you have to also look at as a living organism and you could look at the bees in that as like individual cells like your body and the propolis is part of the entire colony's immune system so an uh, example of that is sometimes in the winter a mouse might run in there and the bees will kill it and uh to deal with uh to deal with a dead mouse in their hive they can't remove it and they will uh completely encompass and mummify the whole thing in propolis um and so uh yeah just things like that that uh, they do. So they use it for a number of things. They also use it to regulate airflow. Uh, so in the winter time, they'll seal the front entrance all off with propolis and just leave a little hole so that they have a better ability to regulate temperature. So that's an all around uh, useful thing and uh, it's antibacterial. So part of the honey, uh, the honeybee colonies and immune system. Awesome. So why don't we answer one question and then we actually only have time for one more video where we're going to learn about honey. So let's grab one question and then we can get into that. Sounds good. What are the bee's favorite flower? Well, you know what? It changes uh, month to month and also location. Honey bees are, uh, uh, they're not in Antarctica, but they're everywhere else. Um, and so their favorite flower varies uh, immensely. Some really popular flowers here is actually the basswood tree. Uh, when the basswood tree blooms, the bees uh, abandon all other flowers and just go to the basswood tree because they love it so much. Um, and so it's sort of hard to say which flower specifically is their favorite, but basswood uh, is definitely one of them. And dandelion. Dandelion is really, really amazing for them. <clears throat> and uh, it's very anti, uh, it, it helps their stomach in the springtime. So dandelions are the, the best in the spring and then basswood in the summer is really popular. Awesome. All right. So now let's learn about honey and then we'll have time for a couple questions at the end, but then we'll have to wrap it up. All right. Here it is. 
Okay, so now I'm gonna show you guys a little bit of honey. So what's going on here in the honey super? So first, I will pull a frame out and let's just see how much honey these bees have made so far. So we've had a really strong nectar flow. So nectar is what's in flowers. So when the bees go to the flowers, nectar is sweet stuff. And along the way, they'll either collect pollen intentionally or when they're getting nectar, Bees are fuzzy, they have hairs all over them. When they're getting nectar, some of that pollen might get on them. And then when they go to the next flower to get nectar, they pollinate. So some of that pollen will rub off and go onto that flower. So that's how bees pollinate. Um, however, we also know honeybees intentionally collect nectar, or pollen rather, for the baby bees in the hive. And so they also pollinate that way. Now this frame is a great example of different stages. So up top here, you can see there's actually wax covering the cells that have honey in them. And then here you can see that these are open and there's a lot of bees with their heads stuck in the cells. So nectar comes out of flowers, maybe around between 30 and 50% sugar but honeybees need to make it over 82% sugar so that honey's shelf stable, so it never goes bad. And so they bring it back to the hive, they pass it around to each other, they filter out anything bad in it, and then they put it in here and they dry it. And when it's ready, they put this capping over. So when a beekeeper's coming to the beehives and he's looking to see if the honey's ready, we wanna see nice capped honey. So honey that they put a little bit of wax over and then that way we know that it's all ready. Now, uh, these bees here, you can see it's not ready, so they're putting their heads in and they're still filling it up. Now, honeybees go a long way to collect honey. They will go easily up to three kilometers to forage. Really intensely, they forage a kilometer way, but if they need to, or if there's a flower that's blooming that they really, really, really love, they'll go five or six kilometers away to collect nectar. So they fly a long, long way. Uh, I also mentioned honeybees' eyesight. Honeybees see in the ultraviolet spectrum. So what they see flowers a little bit different than we do. And on flowers, often on the petals, there's actually a landing strip stripe, or there's a bullseye, and there's all of these really cool different patterns on flowers that we can't see, but honeybees can see to attract them. And so when they're flying around, they can easily identify flowers, even on a cold day, because they, they see with the help of UV light. Now, right, I'm not sure why our videos keep stopping a little bit, but that was the honey. Is there anything you want to add that was at the end of the video? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I don't totally uh, remember what the end was, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just that uh, the, the, the world that honeybees see is very different than, than what we see um, because of that UV light. And um, there's some cool video or some cool photos you can find online. If there's any teachers that are curious, you could Google like, uh, you know, uh, how, what, how do honeybees see flowers with some images and you'll see it's totally a different world than what we live in. Um, and the main thing is, um, the one part I guess about honeybee eyesight that uh, wasn't covered is like honeybees, if they were a superhero, the eyesight would be their superpower. They, they see incredibly uh, well and differently. And, and a big thing for them is a uh, flicker rate. So they have what's called compound eyes. So they're, they're the big eyes and they're made up of lenses and they have what's called a high flicker rate. So if you're driving down the highway and you look beside you, everything's blurry. Or if you wave your hand, it looks blurry. To honeybees, it's not. They can see it perfectly crisp when they're flying really fast. And uh, so they're able to identify flowers, not miss them. And also for drones, which uh, is uh, covered, but uh, you might have to go and watch it. They have even bigger eyes to be able to see the virgin queens flying by them. So uh, that's something uh, about honeybee eyesight. Awesome. All right. So why don't we just do one last question? Unfortunately, we're almost out of time and then we'll have to say goodbye.
Okay. Yes. Good question. Yeah. Is all the smoke from the fires going to hurt the bees? Well, I don't think I wouldn't say hurt them in they they're not going to be physically hurt uh, the individual bee, but it definitely can affect them. For me, for my bees, I was checking on them. They haven't been too affected. What the smoke does is um, it's not it's not so much like the smoke and the smoker that I'm puffing, which is there for a second gone or repels them. If there's a haze like what we have, it can affect the bees ability to forage. And sometimes they just won't leave the hive or they sort of leave and they're disoriented and not totally able to navigate properly. So that can be a big effect if it's here for a long time. Uh, it could affect a honey crop this year for beekeepers because the bees can't get out and forage. And that's happened in Western Canada last year in Manitoba. I know beekeepers had a big, big issue with forest fires uh, affecting their bees. Um, and if it gets really smoky, bees are constantly ventilating their hive. They keep it at a steady 94 degrees Fahrenheit or 34 Celsius. And so all that smoke going in there with that honey that's open that I showed you, they haven't finished it yet. The wax can make the honey taste smoke or sorry, the smoke can make the honey taste smoky. So uh, those would be two ways it would affect them uh, and uh, not not ideal. That's for sure. So, Right. All right. So let's just do one final question. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Okay. Oh, what would I need to get a job like yours? Is there a specific program in college or university? You know what? I am self-taught. I had a very early midlife crisis and quit my city job and moved home and became a beekeeper. And the, the thing with bees is it's so hard to teach academically. It's, it's very hands-on. And every year you learn something new. It's not possible to cover everything at a school program. That being said, uh, University of Guelph has a, an apiary course you can take. Um, there's a commercial beekeeper program at Niagara College, but you have to have already completed a college program. So I would say the best way would be if you're interested, see if there's a local beekeeper that needs help. Uh, if you're a student, you can work in the summer. That's the bee season. That's when beekeepers need help. Um, and beekeeping is... Uh, uh, we, we need beekeepers. We are desperate for help. So if you are interested in it, I'm sure there's a beekeeper that would be willing to, to get you to help. And uh, you could come and check things out or you could get a beehive, uh, something like that. So uh, there's all kinds of ways, but most beekeepers are self-taught or they've done uh, a bit of background in schooling and science and then uh, go on to be beekeepers from there. Awesome. There you go, everyone. Everyone can be a beekeeper. Just got to reach out. It's a nice yeah. one job. Yeah. All right. Well, that's perfect. Graham, thanks so much for showing us these awesome videos of your bee yard and teaching us all about honeybees and locally sourced honey in Ontario. I hope no everyone problem. that is watching learned a lot. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say before we sign off? No, I just hope everyone had a good time. Um, if you are near the honey house, you can come check things out. Uh, we can, uh, you know, you can come see all the honey, try different honeys and, and see some bees. And if, uh, and if anyone has any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer some if they email them to, to you guys or whatever. I'm happy to, to answer some more questions. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I hope a couple of you become beekeepers in the future. And uh, we'll see everyone later. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your week and happy local food week. Bye.